Welcome to the I Love Seville show, guys. It's Jerry Miller. Good Thursday to you. And how about a beautiful Thursday across Charlottesville and Central Virginia? The sun is out. The guns are out. And I'll tell you what, we are going to have some good time fun on this program with Sally Hudson. She might be slight, but she's full of fight. She's full of bite. And we're going to put that into perspective on this platform. The I Love Seville show, thanks to so many people in this fantastic community. You know what we stand for, positivity. It's nothing but positive as we work to change the conversation and change the brand that is Charlottesville and Central Virginia. We do our part. We hope you do your part as well, guys. Hold the door for somebody. Smile at somebody you don't know. Just say thank you, please. Let's keep positivity out there and live life by the golden rule. Let's thank the sponsors. Let's thank the folks that help us put this program on. First, Greenberry's Coffee for 28 years. A husband and wife, guys, took a dream, they took some sweat equity and a beat up Honda Civic, and they made Greenberry's Coffee a global business. That's Sean and Roxanne Simmons. The first coffee shop was in Barracks Road Shopping Center. The roasting facility was in the McIntyre Office Park. Now Greenberry's Coffee has locations in Qatar, in Japan, in Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, soon to open in Portland, Oregon, and it all started right here in Charlottesville, and that makes me happy. Scott Wagner of Scott Wagner Chiropractic and Sports Medicine, the good doctor. Who's got your back? Scott Wagner has your back. We're his advertising agency of record. This gentleman changing people's lives at Scott Wagner Chiropractic and Sports Medicine. Harris Tolber, our director. Judah Wickhauer, our producer. Lauren Linsky upstairs, our producer as well. Ladies and gentlemen, let's introduce you to the one, the only, <laughs> Sally Hudson. Sally, thank you kindly for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. That's quite the drum roll. Yes. Yes. I like, uh, so I've been up since 3.45 in the morning. Um, you, like me, an early riser. Um, I don't know if you're like me. I'm uh, probably 160 ounces of coffee deep right now. <laughs> Um, coffee fan, you? A hydrate and caffeinate. I love it. Yeah. I love it. So we're going to start like we always do. Um, I want to talk about the person first. Sally Hudson. Who is Sally Hudson? The person, her passions, her interests, what she likes to do. Yeah, so I, I wear a lot of hats around Charlottesville. I'm a professor. I'm an economist. I teach at UVA. Uh, I also do a lot of volunteering. I'm lucky that my job is very flexible, and so I have the ability to do a lot of consulting for, for pro bono outfits and for nonprofit groups, sometimes for private firms. Uh, I like to be really involved on city and county boards, a lot of the grassroots politics groups we have along town. And, uh, you know, we live in Charlottesville. We're really blessed to have a great art scene and great outdoors, all of that. So Charlottesville is a great place to keep busy. How about the University of Virginia? You're an economist. Yeah. Um, you know, I think when people think economist at the University of Virginia, first name probably that comes to mind, Ken Elzinga, um, an esteemed professor, put uh, some knowledge in my brain in the early 2000s. Um, just talk to me about how you got, let's talk the birth story. Um, Sally Hudson, start to finish, okay? How did Sally Hudson get to Charlottesville? Perhaps some of the educational training, where you went to school, how you ended up being at, I'd say, the number one public university in America. Yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm very fortunate to be at UVA. Um, and, you know, as an economist, I, I spend a lot of time with numbers, but I'm, I sort of came at it in a roundabout way. I am definitely the, uh, the wayward quant in my family. Uh, my father's a minister. My mom wore a lot of hats in the nonprofit world, so she helped run the YWCA, uh, Halfway House for Domestic Violence Victims, a Refugee Resettlement Agency. Uh, and that meant that I spent a lot of my childhood banging around soup kitchens and those halfway houses and you spend any time in those places, it does not take long to notice that we don't all uh, have the same luck in the world. That, um, and also that I think the folks on the inside of those places and the folks on the outside just aren't that different. Um, that uh, we've got so much more in common than divides us, but a lot of people have a lot of fortune that a lot of don't. And that means that you start to notice that there is our bigger forces at play. There's a bigger machine in motion helping some people get ahead and keeping some folks stuck. Uh, and economics is the study of that. It's the study of who gets what in the world and why. Um, and so I went off to college thinking, hey, maybe I might want to be an economist. Um, took some economics classes my first year of college and, and fell in love with it. Um, and really felt like economics was a toolbox that I could use to tackle so much of those problems that made my parents work necessary. So um, I stuck at it. I was getting to the end of college. I felt like I knew just enough to be dangerous. So I decided to go on and press on and get a PhD. Um, I went to Stanford for college, went over to MIT in Boston for my PhD, um, and then was very fortunate to come down here and join the faculty at UVA. 
I love it. So Harris Tolbert, let's take our first two answers and turn those into sizzle reels, baby. Um, you uh, have a big, beautiful brain, and it's quite obvious with your credentials that you're very talented, you're very smart, your IQ off the charts. One of the things that I think you do really well already is you come across as um, approachable. Um, you have all this knowledge, but that knowledge doesn't come across in an in intimidating fashion like perhaps other folks. You know, it's not someone like, you know, oh, I'm this person and this credit. You know, you're a normal person. And Good I, to hear it. Yeah, I, I love that about you. Um, talk to me a little bit about, and we have questions coming in, and I promise you, I promise you we'll get to your questions. Veronica, we'll get to your question about uh, the, the, the basic income, universal basic income. We'll get to your questions about living wage as an economics professor. We're going to get to all these. If you guys have questions for Sally, please put them on any channel you're watching now. Seven channels across the I Love Seville network we're airing this show on. Like and share the stream. That would mean the world to us. Um, how has the economics piece and the economics background influenced perhaps you from a campaign standpoint? Because I think you have such a well-rounded perspective, and we're going to get into the nitty-gritty. I have some specific questions for you as well, specific questions that are tied to Charlottesville, Central Virginia. Um, just talk to me about how the economics piece from a macro standpoint, before we get to the micro, has impacted you from a platform standpoint. Yeah, totally. Well, I mean, I think that, that economics is at the core of so many of the challenges that we face, whether you're talking about healthcare, whether you're talking about energy, um, you know, whether you're talking about education. At its root, so many of those are economic challenges. It's how do we put the resources behind the kind of solutions we need for the problems that we face. And so, I, you know, as an economist, I tend to see everything through that lens, but I, I think it's a good one. Well, you know what? Um, Donna Shaughnessy says, I'm watching from Richmond. She's in tears about the ERA. Donna Shaughnessy giving you some props right now. You want to give her some props, uh, Sally? Oh, yeah. I love Donna. I would follow her to the ends of the earth. She's one of those people who shows up everywhere. I mean, right now, she's in Richmond rallying for the ERA, but tomorrow she'll be standing up for, uh, you know, against the pipelines or um, for just about any good cause that you can find. Blake Dotting watching in Greene County. Keely Kitchings, I believe, watching in Jersey, in uh, Georgia. Veronica, we're going to get to your questions. Veronica fits you. Mike Sh Shaver watching, I believe, in upstate New York. Jay Milo watching in Almore County. Brent Lillard in the city of Charlottesville. Like and share the stream. That would mean the world to us. How about some of the hobbies and passions, some of the interests? What do you like to do? You grind. I could tell when you and I connected on Facebook Messenger. I think it was like 4.15 in the morning. And you're like, I'm answering emails right now. I know you're in a probably, well, maybe not, considering you pursued a PhD, but maybe one of your hardest working times of your life here as a professor that's also trying to run for Congress here. So you probably don't have a lot of free time. Free time, though, though. I know you like a great glass of wine. I know you like a cold beer here. Talk to me about some of the... I just saw you interact with our I Love Sevo mascot, Liza the dog. You love animals. I mean, talk to me about some of the personal elements before we get to the campaign. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was really a choice. You know, was, was I going to hop in and run for office? It was a time to get a dog. Uh, and I decided <laughs> to go down this stream. Right now, I don't think I can handle both. But, uh, yeah, the next thing that would make me happiest would be to finally get a pup. Okay. Any, any uh, breed that you want? I've got a thing for pit bulls. Yeah? Yeah. Why is that? They're, because they're so misunderstood, and oh. they're really sweet, and they're so loyal. Uh, my friends who have pit mixes, just they're, they're the sweetest things on earth. How has the department, the economics department at the University of Virginia, maybe faculty in totality, have they, how has the response been to Sally Hudson stepping up and running for Congress? I, I've been so blessed. My colleagues have been amazing. Yep. They're fantastic. They're super supportive. And I think they understand, you know, when I was starting to feel like maybe the faculty role wasn't going to be for me for the long term, mm -hmm. I started by going to my colleagues and they said, I get it. I hear where you're coming from and I think you have something to offer. Uh, and so I w I've been so lucky to have their, their support from the, from the get-go. I love it. Brent Barry, Brent Barry, thank you for watching. Mike Stanley, Tyler Barry, thank you for watching. Like and share the stream. That would mean the world to us. John Gilmer, thank you for doing that right now. Tim Ryan, thank you for doing that right now. All we ask is a like and share. And if you want this lady to have even more exposure, the like and share will certainly help that out. Christopher Eagle watching in Almoral County. Let's get to the nitty-gritty. Um, you are running against an entrenched incumbent. That's safe to say. He's this, been there for a long time. Yeah, this guy has been there a long time. Uh, David Toscano, uh, his name certainly uh, rings loud and rings strong in Charlottesville, Central Virginia and Almoral County. Let's start open-ended, going toe-to-toe -to -toe against an incumbent of this amount of uh, experience. 
Talk to me about what you're feeling, what you're thinking. Sure. I mean, let me be the first to say I think David is a good guy, and then I think he has served this community well for a very long time. I mean, he, he's been running for office longer than we've been alive. His first race for Congress was in 1982, uh, so he's been at this for a very long time, and I think all of us uh, owe him a lot of gratitude for the work that he's done, especially at a time when it was really hard to do a lot of service in the General Assembly. Because I think that you know when when Democrats were down you know two to one in the House of Delegates, it's really difficult to get anything done. And so I appreciate his his willingness to serve in those circumstances. Uh, I think we're at a new time in Virginia. I think we're at a new time in Charlottesville. I think it's a really special moment for both our community and for the Commonwealth at large. Because now we've got this General Assembly that's close to 50-50, and that means that so much more is possible. And I think it really matters what kind of voices we send to Richmond in that moment, who are willing to look at it with you know, fresh legs, new blood, and, and have a sense of what's possible, not what can't get done. Because so often what we get told by folks who've been there for a long time, and understandably so, is, is what, what we can't do in Richmond. And I think now is the time to take a view of what we can do in the days ahead. That was so good. That was such a good answer, right? Wasn't that a good answer? Sizzle reel that answer, baby. Christopher Eagle's liking that answer right now. You get a lot of positive feedback on that from Bill Granford, Jonathan Galasso, Sebastian Tello Trillo watching, I believe, in Crozet. Like and share the feed. Keep the spotlight on Sally Hudson, ladies and gentlemen. Um, how... When, when you said, I'm going to run against a guy that has this kind of experience, what was going through your head first? Were you like, am I really going to do this? I mean, is, is, this guy's been around the block for a long time. Or were you looking at, like, like you said, fresh start? I, I see an opportunity here for, like, millennials, Gen Yers, Gen Xers to baby, like, they can relate to me. You know, they, 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 I'm perhaps more relatable. Um, talk to me about what you were thinking. You know, I think that's that's the kind of, of calculus that a, that a thoughtful politician would go into. It That really didn't uh, to, to occupy my thoughts that month. I, I think you, you just got to do what you feel called to do. Uh, and I felt like that there was a voice missing in the room in Richmond. I, you know, I spend a lot of time in Richmond uh, through my work. You know, as an economist, I do a lot of consulting also with government agencies, with folks in the Northam administration. And the time that I was spending in the General Assembly, I felt like there, there was a voice missing in the room. And I felt like that's exactly the kind of voice that our community should be sending. I think that the delegate from Charlottesville is responsible to the people of, of the Charlottesville area and the Albemarle County, um, but also has a responsibility to the Commonwealth. I think we bring something special to the table and we need to be offering up that perspective because otherwise that voice doesn't get heard. Love it. Robert Booker, thank you for watching us. We appreciate you. Like and share the stream. It would mean the world to us. Let's talk about the platform. Yeah. Um, Sally4Virginia.com. One more time on the URL, Sally4Virginia.com. I'm looking at it now. First, give you props on the site. It's pretty good. Really like the design and approachable layout. Really kind of uh, embodies the platform that you're running on. First, healthcare. I cannot agree more. I am an entrepreneur. I'm a small business owner. Um, health, I, my family, uh, my wife and son, um, you know, the, the cost of health insurance is astronomical. Um, we are paying, um, and we're young, uh, nearly 900 a month, and that is small potatoes. I was playing racquetball yesterday against another small business owner, and this guy is in his early 60s. He has no kids. Him and his wife, over 3000 a month, 36000 a year. I'll tell you about my premiums and my health care. 900 a month, $13,000 deductible. The deductible cannot be shared amongst all three of us. So one person could get the six, but if that person has catastrophic, it can't be used against the entire 13. I'm, I'm literally like, why don't I just pay the penalty? But the reason I'm not is because I got a son, okay? I have a son, and I have to do what's right for my son. Talk to me about healthcare. We know that the, the premiums in, in, in our county, in the city of Charlottesville, some of the highest in the nation. And you, and I'm reading it verbatim here, we cannot wait for a federal solution to a local problem. When I saw that, I was like, hell yeah. Talk to me about that. Your story I hear so often. You're not unusual at all. There, there are folks of all stripes all over our community who are facing that challenge. It's a drag on the economy. It's a drag on our businesses. Uh, and it's really a moral failing on our part because we know that in order for everyone really to be to living up to their potential and have all the opportunities we know they deserve, that they've got to have basic health care. And this is a problem that we should be able to solve. And I think we know that we can't wait on D.C. to get it done because we've been waiting on that for too long. Um, I think, you know, right now with this White House, with this Congress, nothing's really going to get passed. And we have people in our community who are hurting right here, right now. And so we need to be looking to Richmond for solutions. I think that solution looks like a state level public option. 
I think that the, that the state needs to be in the mix and offering that backstop so that when we do experience what happened here in central Virginia where the market collapsed and we got down to a monopoly provider, we need to know that the government's always going to have our backs and there's going to be one more plan in the mix. Good answer. Let's sizzle reel that, Harris. Let's call it healthcare. Jason Peterson, thank you for watching us. Donna Shaughnessy, thank you for watching us. Matthew Christensen, Craig Dubow. Dubow? Craig Dubose, thank oh, you for watching yeah. us. Oliver Keen, Sean Donahue, Katie Brandt, Rebecca Wood, Beth Akers, thank you for watching us. Put the questions in any channel that you're watching this through. We're seven channels on the I Love Seville network. I will relay them to Sally Hudson. Ray Cadell in Almoral County says, we pay well over 2,000 a month. It is ridiculous, and something has to be done with it. Questions coming in rapid fire via Twitter. I will get to the Twitter questions as well. Michael Jamison, thank you for watching us. Ann Parrish Utz, thank you for watching us in Almoro County. How often, you've touched about it already, you hear it everywhere you go about the healthcare piece. Where does that stand in your platform? You think that's kind of like one of the go-tos for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's kitchen table conversation here in our community. It's the kind of thing that keeps people up at night. That means it should be at the top of the list for our representatives too. Um, let's throw some questions here. We got some tough questions coming in. Tough but fair. Let's do it. T tough but fair. Um, this one's coming from Veronica Fitzhugh. First, mm -hmm. she has a lot of questions for you. Where do you stand on a living wage as an economics professor and a person of conscience? Sure. So I think that the, that the minimum wage is one of those examples where we have to go past the economics 101. Because we know that the most basic story that we get told when we take that first class is that if you raise the minimum wage, you're automatically going to get unemployment because employers won't be able to foot the higher bill. I think those of us who have made our profession out of, out of economics work know that the story is a little more complicated than that. And particularly for communities like Charlottesville, where we have several very large employers that dominate our market. So between the city and the university and the hospital, we've got a bunch of these big players, and they play by different rules. So they're not always setting those competitive free market invisible hand kind of wages. For them, the bargaining power between workers and firms plays a much bigger role. And so absolutely, I think that we need to, to have the kind of freedom in this community to make sure that those the wages for those um, companies are rising with the cost of living here. But right now in Charlottesville, our hands are tied because the minimum wage is set at the state level. Our minimum wage in Virginia is $7.25 an hour. Right, so we're still sit sitting there down at, at the federal min. West Virginia's minimum wage is higher than ours. Um, and so I think what we need is folks who are willing to go to Richmond and say that localities, communities need to be able to set their own minimum wage so that we can keep pace with the cost of living. I love it, I love it. Call that minimum wage on a sizzle reel there, Harris Tolbert. A um, lot of questions coming in. I'm gonna get to these questions. I'm gonna play devil's advocate with Sally for the sake of the program. Let's do it. Um, small business owner, okay? Yeah. These guys paid well, 7% raises every year. Mm -hmm. um, one of the few, I think, that offer that. I look at the team members as family and not team members. Yeah. Yeah. Literally family. Uh, but where I'm going with this is, you know, a lot, we're an advertising agency, and some of the businesses that we're servicing say if we're raising the, uh, the minimum wage, yeah. um, then perhaps instead of having more employees, we'll then just go to the subcontractor route. Yeah. If, we weigh, if we raise the minimum wage, um, this is going to impact us from being able to, say, like, offer, you know, more bonuses or other benefits to our employees because we have more cost out of pocket. If we raise the minimum wage, the people that potentially could get hurt are the customers that patronize those businesses because the cost to, to, to cover the additional wage has to be paid by the customers that are going to those businesses for whether it's restaurants, whether it's uh, retail, whatever it may be. Throwing it to you open-ended. Your thoughts on that? Absolutely. I mean, that's going to happen all the time in economics, and that's what makes being an economist an interesting challenge is that there are all those trade-offs. There's all of those competing constituencies, and we're trying to do what's best for all of them on balance. I think you raised a great point about the subcontractors. We see that so much these days with a shift of employers moving from the folks who they keep in-house and going to the, the other outlets. And I think that we're at a time where at the federal level, we need a whole-scale overhaul of U.S. labor law. I mean, it just hasn't caught up with the changing economy. Um, so there's, you know, the, all of those competing policies. The minimum wage is only one of them. It's a super blunt instrument, but it needs to be part of the picture. Um, it's really interesting, you know, in other countries where they, they don't rely so heavily on the minimum wage to, to boost uh, incomes, uh, you know, like places like Germany, um, they don't have a big 
countrywide minimum wage. They, they have their wages more, more locally bargained between local industry. So they have like wage boards where they'd say they would have like, you know, all of the lightweight manufacturing places and they would bargain for their wages. Um, I think that that kind of model might be something that we need to be moving toward in the long run in the US. I think we could learn a lot from those places. But in the meantime, raising the minimum wage has to be part of the problem, or part of the solution. There you go. Anja Andalek, I see you, lady, the owner of FIG on the University of Virginia corner. Love you, Anja Andalek. Cameron Wells March, nothing but love for you as well, Cameron Wells March. Rod Brunel, thank you for watching us. Real estate agent extraordinaire, Roy Wheeler Realty Company. Michael Guthrie, thank you for watching us. Chris Turner and Crozet, thank you kindly for watching us. Like and share the feed, that would mean a lot to us. You increase the minimum wage, I think this is going to be one of the byproducts. The gig economy, and we're seeing the gig economy with a local company called Moonlighting. Uh, we see the gig economy with people posting their, uh, their services on, say, Craigslist. Uh, the gig economy with a website like Odesk that literally aggregates subcontractors and allows folks to position uh, a bid um, and subcontractors can fill those bids. We see that with uh, websites like 99designs. I think the gig economy is going to go to another level if the minimum wage has increased. Throw it to you, uh, Sally Hudson. Folks have been saying that for a long time. It just hasn't panned out in practice. The subcontractors that you were talking about earlier form a much larger share of our economy. There's actually uh, some really great work done by some former colleagues of mine, um, one of them up at Harvard and at Princeton, where they you know, went and crunched the numbers and said, so how many folks do we actually have out in the true gig economy? The Ubers, and the task rabbits, and they're hanging out around 1% of the labor force. The 10% of the labor force are more like the subcontractors who work for Aramark and are doing dining services for the university. So they're the kind of folks who would be impacted by a minimum wage increase. The, the gig economy as we know it, I think is weighs heavier in, my mind, in our minds because we use it as, as consumers. Right? We're those folks who are at the, the higher end of the, of the income spectrum, and so um, those services are, are really familiar to us, but turns out they, they don't account for as much of the labor force as we might think. Steve Christensen in Albemarle County says, um, how do you, this is a tough question. Let's go for it's it. It's a fair question, but it's tough. Um, this is, Steve, this is an interesting question. Um, University of Virginia assistant professor, UVA has a PR image issue with what it's paying uh, some of its subs. Okay, where do you stand on this? I absolutely think the university should step up and raise wages, both for our subcontractors and for our, our full-time employees. Right now, um, you know, there, it's, it's often even hard to get information about what the subcontractors are paying. You know, we need that, that transparency, and then we need those wages to, ri those wages to rise. Um, let's talk about some elements, other elements on your platform. And you know what? I'm going to get to your question here. This is question is being asked a number of times. Okay. Um, on Twitter, it's being asked on Facebook, it came via IG. Your take on what our governor is currently going through? A lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, all three of them, uh, um, you know, Attorney General Herring and uh, Lieutenant Governor Fairfax, obviously the governor as well, three, three distinct stories, but I think all symptoms of the same problem, which is Richmond is a place that protects its own. You know, it's a place that often puts politics in front of public service, and I think we're seeing that pan out. Do you can. think you should step down? I do. Um, obviously, you know, what's in his past in the photograph, that's deeply troubling. It's, it's dehumanizing. Um, but in, in many ways, his behavior since has been even more disappointing, um, both immediately, you know, in the press conference. Yeah, when he was trying to moonwalk and he needed his wife to tell him yeah. that this is not appropriate. I mean, what, that press conference, like, was watching an episode of Young and the Restless. I thought Cricket was going to walk in next. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? He needs his wife? to tell him not to moonwalk? I mean, talk to me a little bit about this. Yeah, I mean, how many governors are just one level-headed woman away from trying to moonwalk their way out of a scandal? I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's been really troubling as folks have been looking in, in the weeks that have followed to see whether or not he's really going to walk the walk and show that he is someone who understands the, the deep history and pain and, and all the modern incarnations of racism. I don't think he's delivered. Um, you know, he had a great opportunity. He had a lot of folks calling for him to, to come down and join us in Union Hill. Um, earlier this week when, when Reverend Barber was there uh, trying to, to combat the, the clear environmental racism of the pipelines that are tearing through Buck Buckingham County. Um, and he didn't answer that call. That would have been a really, really concrete thing he could have done to show that he understood how racism permeates so much of our culture and our politics in so many ways, and he didn't step up. 
Buddy Fox, I'm watching in Forest Lakes right now. Sally, do you believe in second chances potentially for the governor? Aren't we all human and we make mistakes? Um, something that happens in the early 80s may, may not be a reflection of someone in 2019. I, I absolutely do believe in second chances and, and thirds and fourths. Um, but I think that what we've learned by the way the governor has handled the last few weeks is that he's got a long way to go when it comes to being a leader on racial justice. I, I think it's important to remember that when we're talking about these leaders, we're not just holding them to the good guy standard. Right? They're not just good guys. They're the top three guys in elected office right now, and I think that's a higher standard. I don't think it's too much to ask that the governor of Virginia in 2019 should be able to lead a mature and historically accurate and, and nuanced agenda on race. I don't think that's too much to ask. Abby Tenenbaum Guskin, thank you for this comment. Sally Hudson, Northrum has a huge opportunity to step up and help Union Hill residents prevail and stop the compressor. Yes, keep talking about this and ask Sally Hudson about Union Hill. You were there. You were... I was there. Yeah, yeah. Like three days ago, right? Two days ago? Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, that, that, those are the kind of rooms that I grew up in. I mean, that was, that was a lot of um, interfaith organizing, uh, inter, interracial organizing. That was a lot of folks standing up for something that mattered. Um, and, you know, I, I believe that there's a really important interplay between policy and politics um, and that kind of movement organizing. I, you know, I understand that in that moment, nothing concrete happens that changes something. It's not like a law gets passed. But those are the rooms that you go to to charge your batteries and fill your bucket and remind yourself why you're doing and what matters so that you can come back and, and do all the hard work it takes to get it done. That's a good answer right there. Gilly Garf, thank you for watching the show. Charlottesville Planning Commissioner Rory Stolzenberg, thank you for tuning in on the program. Sarah Hill Buczynski, thank you for watching us. D Specs, thank you for watching us. Live across seven channels on the I Love Seville network. Put a comment or a question in any box that you're watching this through, and I will relay them to Sally Hudson here. Um, Union Hill, what did you see? Talk to uh, me about, I mean, it had an impact on you. I saw the video it was great. you posted, right? It was yeah, amazing. Talk it to me was about great. That. I mean, the energy in that room was great. Um, obviously, I've, I've had the the great fortune to see Reverend Barber speak twice uh, in person in my life. That was the second time. Um, and he doesn't disappoint. Um, and I think he reminds us uh, really, you know, as, as all great preachers do, to, to refocus what we're doing around what's right and what's wrong. Uh, Union Hill is an environmental tragedy. Um, and it's an expression of, of very clear racism, which is, is a problem on so many levels in what we do in Virginia. I mean, what we've got, for the folks who may, may not know yeah, the backstory give a of Union Hill, yeah. let, me give, let me give a little backstory. So, um, you know, we have two pipelines tearing through Virginia right now, um, not just disrupting our national, or our, you know, our beautiful landscape, um, but also really just a, a boondoggle effort. I mean, these are, these are pipelines that are gonna ship fracked gas from somewhere else to outside of our state. Um, rather than providing any energy for folks here in Virginia. And we're going to foot the bill, and we're going to foot the, all the, in, the uh, environmental consequences of that. So what's happening in Union Hill is that there is a, a compressor station, which is like a, you know, a, a big installation that helps keep the pressure of the pipeline as it moves along. And they're really dangerous. They're really loud. They let off a lot of gas. Like periodically, they have to, to have to emit gas. And so the, the people who are going to live around them are going to have to suffer all the health consequences of that. It's going to poison their air and their water. And it's not an accident that in the state of Virginia, the compressor station's going in a historically black community. That's what so often we see is that it's not affluent communities like ours here in Charlottesville that have to bear the brunt of those projects. It winds up in places where there are people who are less empowered to speak out. Um, and so down in Union Hill, we were there for, for a mass rally with Reverend Barber, um, with former Vice President Al Gore, and with a whole lot of people from all over the Commonwealth who care about standing up for folks who aren't being heard. Um, and I think that that's, that's what was happening there. That was such a baller answer. Such a baller answer. Ray Cadell, do you think, he has this question, do you think that of the three guys at the top of the Commonwealth government, if they were Republicans, this would be handled differently now? Oh, I, I think that you'd be hearing even stronger calls from there to resign from, from folks in Charlottesville and folks on the left. I'm not going to pretend like that stuff doesn't get um, you know, viewed through a partisan lens. Um, question coming in via Twitter and via text message now. Um, any money taken from uh, corporate PACs? Would you take any campaign money from Dominion? Uh, no corporate PACs for me. Not a, all real life people. Okay. How about some of the supporters? Let's highlight them now. Uh, financial supporters? Yeah. I mean, I've been very fortunate that as soon as I got in this race... Sonia you know, stepped up. She did, yeah. Big time. Would you get a hundy? Yeah, yeah. hundred K? I was very fortunate to get a, a really early investment from Sonia Smith. Yeah. That's amazing. And, and how did that help the, this campaign? 
Well, let me be the first to say that Sonia's incredibly financially generous, mm -hmm. but it's her mentorship that's worth its weight in gold. She, especially to a lot of women around our community, um, she is someone who uh, really takes an interest in people. She's she's not she's not a bleeding heart who just invests in every cause, um, you know, full of, of good fighters. She's someone who invests in leaders. She invests in people who she thinks can get the job done, and so I, I feel um, very fortunate that she sees that in me. But far far more valuable from my perspective, uh, you know, besides the financial contribution is that she's you know always in my ear giving me advice about you know what I'm what I'm doing well what could get better so that's sizzle reel that call that Sonia right there she invests in winners she has a strong track record of investing in winners um, so I you know I'm giving you some props right there she has a strong track record of investing in winners Mary Gregory McIntyre she says and no you did not miss this Mary Gregory McIntyre thank you for leaving this question like and share the stream on any channel you're watching drop a comment in the comment box she says I'd love to hear Sally talk about her views on the work of the Hate Free Schools Coalition in the county to pressure Almore County Schools to ban the Confederate flag from the schools. This is such a hot topic. We have one Almore County School Board member who legitimately in the newspaper was quoted as saying, schools are a place where kids should feel challenged and taken out of their comfort zone, and having the Confederate flag in the school system challenges our kids and gets them out of their comfort zone. When I read this, I spit the coffee out of my mouth. I was like, how is this gentleman on the board of, on the school board thinking like this? So I'm gonna get back to Mary Gregory's question, your thoughts on it. I hadn't heard that quotation. That that is straight up stunning. Right. Yeah. It's stunning. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that that dealing with our past is, is a charge that we inherit with every generation. And I think that right now we're working through that pain in our community. I applaud the Charlottesville School Board for stepping up and taking that action. I don't think they would have gotten there without the Hate Free Schools Coalition. I think it's impressive that because of the organizing they were doing in Albemarle County, um, you know, the Char Charlottesville's community responded first. Um, and I applaud all of the activists who continue to work for that. I, you know, I have a lot of faith that they're going to make some real progress sometime soon. Neil Williamson from the Enterprise Free Forum. Thank you for watching us on the program. Like and share the feed. It would mean the world to us. Questions coming in via Instagram Messenger right now. Um, direct, I mean, They're sliding into your DMs? Mo is the Constantly. <laughs> yeah, it's part of the job. Uh, multimedia. Yeah. Multimedia. Um, Sally Hudson, your thoughts on uh, our statues, the Confederate statues in and around Charlottesville, um, and what we should do with them? It's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a similar question. Again, I think, I think every generation inherits the charge to decide what we celebrate. Um, I don't know how we can, you know, be part of this community right now and, and think that that's something that we should we should be celebrating. Um, I think it's important for us to understand the historical context in which those those statues went up, that they are an artifact of the Jim Crow era. It's not an accident. They went up in the 1920s. That was a time where a lot of white people were trying to remind a lot of black people of their supposed place in society. Um, and so I think that um, especially after everything that's happened in the last two years. I don't know how you can can go into that park and think that that's a place of that where there's something to celebrate. I mean, it's a, it's a real um, it's you know it's strange. It feels like every time you you walk through there, it's a reminder. It's a reminder, and I think what we really have to embrace is for a lot of people, they've been feeling that way for a very long time. You know, I'm torn on this, and we're gonna, Michael Guthrie. We will get to this question, guys. Like and share the feed. Drop a question in any chat box you're watching now. We'll relay them to Sally Hudson if they're respectful and appropriate. That's the only caveat I ask of you. Um, this is how I was initially. I was like, taking these statues out of Lee Park or whatever park it may be is not going to change history. Um, it's not going to change history. And then I literally was here in front of this building, I'm going to be honest, owned just under 40% of this building here. I was trying to protect, wanted to protect the building. I also knew that this is the, these events were going to be in AP U.S. history when my son was studying, and I wanted to be able to relate my firsthand perspective to my son. Son, I was there. This is what happened. This is what I saw. Um, so my stance on this has changed. Initially, I was like, Removing the statues will not change the history. Then I saw what happened on August 12th firsthand with my own two eyeballs. I saw the nastiness, hate, Sally, stuff that I've never seen before in my entire life. People beating people with sticks, pulling guns, literally saw it firsthand. It was a freaking war zone, man. And after seeing that, my perspective changed. Um, and then after seeing the pain and after talking with friends of mine who are, are, are either leaders in the African-American mm -hmm. community or everyday Joes in the African-American community, and they say to me, this is a reminder of pain and it hurts me to see this. And then I'm like, these statues do not need to be in public parks. 
I understand Paul McIntyre, McIntyre School of Commerce, one of the three things he said, if I'm going to donate this land to the city of Charlottesville is A, Lee Park is what it's going to be called, B, the statue of Robert E. Lee is going to be called here, and C, it's going to be a park for perpetuity. Okay, so two of those three things, Charlottesville, I hate to say this, has to break a promise to a benefactor and a philanthropist that was Paul McIntyre. These statues are better served in museums where people can go to a museum and they can appreciate something from history as opposed to public parks where kids and families share freaking picnics. I mean, it's just, it, it is, it almost is like a no-brainer to me now. Talk to me about what you're thinking here. You know, I, I think a lot of people feel the way you do, and I think a lot of people have made exactly those moves over the last couple of years who, have, who um, were sort of in the, the privileged position of not having to feel the pain that those statues cause, but now when it was on full display for our full community, um, I think understand now the, you know, the full history of it, and I think it's time for us to move on. Good answer, good answer. Um, this is a question that's coming in on every single platform. Like and share the feed, drop a question in here if you have a question. This is coming in via text message right now, okay? You see the text messages with the blue dots next to them. Um, how do we change and help Charlottesville heal post-812? I think it starts by elevating the voices of communities of color here um, because they've been leading the way for so long. And I think now it has become um, obvious to a, a lot of the white residents of Charlottesville that now is a time for us to listen, not to talk. Um, we have so many leaders in this community, whether they are um, historians or activists or journalists who have so much to teach us. Um, and so now one of the, those times to flip the switch from um, transmit to receive. We got a question coming in from Richmond. Um, he asked not to be named. I won't use your name. That's fine. I'll respect your privacy. What um, are your thoughts on being a, a female running in an otherwise male-dominated field and profession? Uh, you know, I was, I was very fortunate. My parents put strong women role models in front of me from day one. Uh, you have moxie. I do? Yeah. You <laughs> have, I feel it. You have, like, you have moxie and confidence and heart. And you have, um, you have a sense of fearlessness that I think is uh, realistic, not unrealistic. I think everyone in, that has any common sense understands the uphill battle that's in front of you going against an incumbent. Um, but you have, you, have, you have moxie to you, and I think that confidence is contagious. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just I feel it on the set. Oh, well, you know, I'm glad that it comes off. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was fortunate. I had, I had parents who, who put really strong women in front of me from day one. My, um, so my, my folks named me Sally after Sally Ride, who was the first female astronaut. They were both, you know, humanities folks. They thought it'd be cool to have a daughter who was a scientist. Um, and so, they, you know, they put that up as a role model. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes when I go home and I look at the books on the shelves at the kind of the women that they held up as examples for me, it's, you know, Marie Curie and Wilma Rudolph and Mia Hamm, you know, all of these great female leaders. My hope is that 10 years from now, hopefully sooner, women like me won't get asked that question. You know, that you'll get to That's be... the norm. Right? Exactly. It's like you can be judged just because you're good, not because you're a girl. That's a great answer. That is a great answer right there. Bala Muluf, thank you for watching this program right now, guys. Like and share the feed anywhere you're at here. Who are some, and you've touched on this already, uh, Kate Lucas, thank you for liking and sharing the stream here. Who are some of the people um, that are your inspiration? Some of, your, some of the leaders, some of the influencers, some of the people that you look up to? Uh, I mean, you know, it starts with family. I think that, you know, that's like so many people. I was fortunate in that way. But, I mean, in terms of politics? In terms of anything in life. In terms of anything. So, I mean, I'm very new to politics. I'm not someone who can claim to have been super plugged into politics until relatively recently. Um, so I would say that the... The, for me, a lot of the inspiration comes from the leaders of, of grassroots movements. I mean, actually, very recently, I've gotten on um, the, the folks who fired up the, uh, the Politicians Not Voters movement in Michigan, which led their anti-gerrymandering effort. I mean, these were just people who decided to start mouthing off on Facebook the day after the 2016 election and say, you know what, we're going to change this. We're going to pass a constitutional amendment in our state. Two years later, they got it done. I mean, in the midterm elections in 2018, they got that ballot initiative passed, and watching somebody take something so, to so, so quickly go from we've got a problem to we've got an answer to let's make it happen, I think that's really inspiring. Um, a lot of stuff coming in about affordable housing, which we will get to. We are 40 minutes in. It's felt like four. She's crushing it. Dan Barnes, thank you for liking and sharing the stream. Meg Taylor, I respect you. Thank you for liking and sharing the stream. Uh, Michael Guthrie's got a question coming in. Jerry, many folks believe that the Western Bypass was on its way to approval until the longtime African-American graveyard was found in its route. Um, so this is kind of piggybacking on uh, Union Hill kind of piggybacking on, the, uh, on, on Dominion and the pipeline. I mean, 
Let's talk eminent domain. Let's yeah. Talk, let's talk dominion. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start open-ended before getting into specifics. One of my best buddies who was a groomsman in my wedding um, lives in Nelson County. Okay. Um, and straight up, straight up, dominion is like, we're going to take part of your land, dude, and we're going to put a pipeline here, and you're going to have no say about it. And as an entrepreneur myself, as someone who's very much a libertarian, um, who, is, who is socially liberal, physically conservative, um, I just find that, like, appalling. Like, a piece of land that's in my buddy's family for four generations, someone, uh, a, a corporate company can go in and say, give it to me. I mean, it's freaking ridiculous. Talk to me, talk to me about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that we understand that the government has to have some eminent domain powers, but that you should be doing it for public gain. And this is pure private gain, right? This is all about enriching dominion. Um, and I think that we know that that problem is about the deep rot in Richmond. You know, Dominion is the single largest donor to both parties, to both Democrats and Republicans. And that means that they're not just buying... They're their, hedging. Yeah, I mean, they're not, they're not just buying their votes on specific bills. They're just buying general silence when Dominion does anything. Um, and so, yeah, I, you know, I'm right there with you. And I think that that has really created a powerful coalition that wants to stand up to that kind of that naked corruption. It's landowners. It's environmentalists. I mean, anything that gets the, you know, the libertarian leaning small business owners right there with the hippie tree huggers. Like, that's a great group of people who great are going to get something done. Yeah. Great. I mean, it's almost we're in this position. And I'm curious of your thoughts here. What happened to like the progressive Republicans and the conservative oh. Democrats. I mean, there was a time where we had a two-party system that was such so much more open-minded and so much more willing to work together and so much more willing to do things in concert. Now everyone is so strong and towing the party lines like, I am a Democrat. I'm not gonna work with those nasty Republicans. Or I'm a Republican, I'm not gonna work with those bedwitting liberals. Where are the progressive Democrats? Where are the, where are the conservative Democrats and the progressive Republicans? That's one of the issues we have. The second issue we have is we have a two-party system where we need a three-party system. If the Libertarian Party had any kind of like legitimacy behind it, and I am a Libertarian at heart, but I know that that party where we're at right now is the red-headed stepchild of politics, for lack of a better phrase. Talk to me about this, Sally. Yeah, can we dig into this on yeah. a lot of different Please. levels? Because I feel like we've Anywhere got something to talk go. about here. Yeah. No, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I think, I think we're in a moment that is less about left versus right and more about big versus little. Mm -hmm. It's about really concentrated power, and it's about power from people, from small business owners, you know, from local activists. It's about you know, empowering localities to govern in a responsive way to our community. So, yeah, absolutely, I'm with you there. Um, I, like, I reacted when you talked about progressive Republicans because I spent a lot of my childhood in Nebraska. Um, which is a place where there's a strong history of progressive Republicans. I mean, famous guys like Senator George Norris, where progressive used to mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand up for the little guy, um, and that that wasn't a partisan thing. Um, so I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, you know, and when you talk about, about breaking up a two-party system, you know, I, I, that resonates with me, too, in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, I'm an economist, right? We know that uh, we live in a duopoly. Like, we live in a political duopoly. Um, duop More options, the better. Duopolies are lousy for consumers, right? Like, you know, basic economics will tell you that when you've got a concentrated market, it's going to restrict supply. In politics, the product is good ideas. So we all lose out when there's only two purveyors of that product. You're right? offering so much great perspective. Give me a little closer to the mic because I want to oh, make gosh. sure everybody no, no. keeps going. I'm sorry. Going. No, it's just, I mean, it's like, it's something that you can look at from a lot of lenses. You can look at it. I mean, it's obviously, uh, that politics right now is broken is obvious to so many folks, but it's, it's broken in its structure. Um, and I think I'm someone who has worked really hard to, to try to think about concrete solutions to that problem. Have we, have we talked all at, at all about the fair vote ranked choice no, voting stuff? Up, tell me yeah. So one of my, my other side projects I like to keep busy like mm -hmm. you is, um, uh, you know, my post 2016 passion project was launching a fair vote Virginia. We are Virginia chapter of the national ranked choice voting movement, which is working to advance ranked choice voting around the country. Um, um, my guess is that there are some folks, maybe you could ask them, um, who are on the stream who've never heard of ranked choice voting. Um, it's also known as... I didn't hear about it until I started researching you. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's also known as instant runoff, and it is something that has been sweeping the nation now um, in the last few years. Uh, with a, with a ranked choice ballot, you don't just vote for one candidate. You get to rank the candidates from most to least favorite. So you say, here's my first choice, here's my second choice, and if I can't have them, then my, here's my third. 
Um, and it's designed to, to solve exactly the kind of problem that we saw in, say, the, the GOP primaries in 2016, where you had a really deep field running, and you had a guy like Donald Trump who was coming out of those early primaries with like 25 or 30 percent of the vote. But you had six, seven, eight candidates and a whole bunch of people who were divided among them. And, you know, they might have had Ted Cruz favorite or Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio, but they didn't have a way to say, hey, I would like any of these guys over Donald Trump because there was no way to put never Trump on a ballot. Ranked choice voting solves that problem. It lets us say, you know, my, my thoughts on this are a little more nuanced than just like with us or against us. It's here's my first choice and here's my backup. The old guard is worried about losing control and that's why that is not a reality in 2019. Your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, not yet here in Virginia, but it is in so many places. So major metropolitan areas in the U.S. have been using ranked choice for a long time. Minneapolis, Why St. not Paul. Virginia? Because uh, the old guard doesn't want to lose control? Uh, so it starts with the Dillon rule, as do most things in Virginia. So in Virginia, if we want to use ranked choice voting at the local level, um, we have to amend the state election code first. So that is the work that we've been doing with Fair Vote Virginia, is working to sponsor that bill. I think it's exactly what you're talking about in terms of building new coalitions across party lines. So um, that work has been led by two delegates, Nick Freitas from Culpeper, who's a, a libertarian-leaning Republican, um, and uh, Patrick Hope, who's a Democrat up in Arlington, both guys who believe that voters should have more choices. Shannon and Nelson says your thoughts on the Dillon rule. Ah, Perfect segue. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think that so many of the conversations we want to have here in Charlottesville, whether it's about wages or affordable housing or the statues, eventually bump up against the Dillon rule. And I think it's time that we rethink that. Um, I've thought that for a while. Um, I'm not a lawyer, and so I knew that I had to, to do some homework on that. Um, so when I decided, like, hey, it seems like the Dillon rule should be something that we should be able to get rid of, um, I went to Rick Schrager, who's a professor at the law school. We are very blessed in this community to have experts on just about everything just around the corner. Um, and I said, Rick, take me to school. Um, and he did what any good professor does, did. And he said, here's my reading list. Like, I need you to read these, these 10 things and then we'll talk. And we did. And he, you know, he taught me a lot of great history. And it turns out that, you know, there is a concrete process we could pursue to become a home rule state. Um, it's interesting. So I'm originally from Iowa. We moved around a lot. Iowa. When I was growing up. I mean, they were one of the pioneers. So with the Dillon, okay. Dillon, Dillon was Iowan, right? It's their fault. Uh, but 50 years ago, Iowa ditched the Dillon rule. There's actually, there are small towns all across the state that are holding actual parades this year to celebrate the end of the Dillon rule because it spurred a rural resurgence. You know, it gave localities the, the autonomy they needed to govern in a responsive way. So it's not, it can, it's not that it can't be done. It just can't be done if you have that attitude. Like nothing can, right? I love it. How about affordable housing? Affordable housing on the hot top. It's a hot topic everywhere. Affordable housing. Patsy Strong, thank you for watching us right now. Like and share the feed. That would mean the world to me, guys. Leave your comments in the comment box of any channel you're watching. If you want to send me DMs, guys, I will get to these Twitter questions. I certainly uh, will do my best. This is um, impressive. Oh, my gosh. You have... <laughs> So many questions. I'm going to try my best to get to these questions. Okay. Um, affordable housing in the city of Charlottesville, the urban ring, Almoro County, Almoro County in totality. Um, I wrote a very thorough analysis on this on ilovesevil.com. I tied that analysis to public transportation and how our crappy public transportation system is tremendously impacting affordable housing. We'll get to that shortly. Let's start open-ended first and get your thoughts. Affordable housing, City of Charlottesville, Albemarle County. Our mayor came on this set, um, and Mayor Walker said we are in an affordable housing crisis. Um, we also had um, Heather Hill, Charlottesville City Councilor, come in and agree with Mayor Walker. Talk to me about affordable housing in your stance. Yeah, I mean, I think affordable housing really needs two things. We need flexibility and we need resources. The flexibility can come from Richmond. That's another great example of a place where our hands are tied in a lot of ways. Um, and then, you know, at the local level, we need to invest resources because like you said, it's, it's a multifaceted problem. It's not just about building the right structures here in the city. It's about making sure that folks have access to the transportation that they need. You know, it's a, um, gosh, I'm going to forget which local news station, but CBS, uh, CBS they're doing yeah. a, a wonderful series right now. Life without now. a car. Life without a car in Charlottesville. And you understand that you've got folks who are a 15-minute drive from their job, but they're spending an hour and a half um, on the bus each night to get home. You know, we should be able to invest in making that slicker for them. So how does it, how do we, okay, you're an economist. You're a lot smarter than I am, okay? Um, our city council is considering raising real estate taxes, okay? I... I'm going to speak from firsthand perspective because that's what I know. Uh, I am a landlord. In my leases, 
it says there is a 4.75% escalator each year for the leases. And I am on the low end downtown, on the low end. Most of the leases are triple net leases where the tenant has to cover the insurance, the taxes, maintenance, everything tied to the property. I don't do that because I know the tenants that I'm focusing on are oftentimes small business owners and entrepreneurs where they don't have the disposable income for that. As a result, I have 100% occupancy in my roster, 23 tenants. Here's where I'm going with this. If we raise real estate taxes, Sally, in the city of Charlottesville and in Albemarle County, landlords will pass this to the tenants. Charlottesville City Council and our mayor specifically, Mayor Walker, is a huge proponent of raising these taxes to help the taxes then be used for other allocated goals, ideas, whatever it may be. How can city council be a proponent and, of social justice and be a proponent of making affordable, making housing in the city of Charlottesville more affordable for our most impoverished, impoverished citizens, our, struggle, our citizens who may be struggling financially, who are making less than AMI, area median income, but still float the idea of raising real estate taxes? No, I mean, I think you're hitting on something which is, which is really important. We always have to be worried about, the, about how tax policy plays out in practice. I think one thing they can be doing is asking for more help for Richmond. Because I think that there are so many communities all over the country that are struggling with an affordable housing crisis. We are not alone. We know it's going to take a major injection of resources. But I think you're right that if we try to, to go at it whack-a-mole style and, you know, raise the, raise, you know, you, you took some economics. We don't tax intermediate goods. That, that, I was more looking at the pretty girls in the first row. But as an entrepreneur, I've, I've had to learn this very, very, very quickly firsthand because it's directly impacting my businesses. Um, and here, here's where I'm going with this here. And I'm going, Lloyd Snook running for Charlottesville City Council says this. Okay. Okay, this is an attorney. He's right here in the back. Yeah, no, I look. Okay, I look. so the property tax, he's speaking specifically on the Keith Woodard property on Water Street that was an $80 million project that City Council somehow kiboshed. Um, Keith Woodard, big time developer known, had $1.2 million of skin in the game with underground infrastructure. The city had skin in the game as well. Lloyd says the property tax on a property valued at $80 million, which is admittedly not the same as a property that costs $80 million to build, is going to be at least $0.95 cents per $100. In other, wo other words, $760,000. Raising one penny on our property tax rate will generate about 700000 If we build two $80 million buildings, we don't need a tax hike at all. You know, I'd have to check uh, Lloyd's math on the fly, but, it, you know, it, that's often... This guy's math is probably not wrong. Yeah, this yeah. No, I believe guy. it. Yeah. No, but, I mean, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think that we... Look, if we want progressive policies, and by progressive, I'm using the term as an economist, the kind of things that lift folks up and bring us closer together, ultimately you got to raise progressive revenue, right? I mean, you can't, you know, a rising tide will not lift all boats if some of the boats start out lower than others. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think we got to come up with ways to raise revenue in a way that, that supports the kind of people you're talking about. I think we have to look at it as, as entrepreneurs and as small business owners, and I know that's who I am because that's who I am, so that's my mindset. But instead of looking at it as like tax our citizens across the board with, here's a good example. In a recent survey, 44% of African Americans felt unwelcomed on the Charlottesville downtown mall. And one of the reasons was the cost of restaurants was so high that, it said in the survey, felt like they could not afford the restaurants. If we raise the meals tax, that's gonna further increase the financial barrier of entry downtown. And it's further going to reinforce that downtown might be for white folks and not black folks. And that's just freaking wrong. Because the downtown mall is our crown jewel. And it should be championed, it should be celebrated, it should be revered, and it should not have a barrier of entry. When we raise the meals taxes, when we raise the real estate taxes, it has a negative impact on the exact folks that we're trying to raise these taxes to support and prop up. Talk to me about that. That's interesting. So um, imagine, so you're sitting there thinking about the consumer who's right on the margin, like the person who's, who's deciding, maybe I would go out to dinner tonight, 
if I if the meals were a little bit cheaper. So you're trying to figure out how do I capture that person. So the first question we got to ask is how many of those are there? Like how many are those folks who if the meal was not seven cents a dollar cheaper or yeah, sorry the tax is like going to be like a point and a half, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. If we're not going to buy an extra point and a half, who's the person who feels like that's out of reach right now, but wouldn't if that tax were a little bit lower. My sense is that that is not actually the pivotal thing that's keeping most people from the downtown mall, but even if it were, okay. even if it were, okay. the other piece of tax incidents that we have to take in mind is how many people are there. So like, suppose that there's somebody who would come to the downtown mall once a month, and they're trying to decide whether or not they go because of that small change. But there are folks working for software developers who are getting lunch on the downtown mall every single day, on balance, you're going to raise a whole lot more revenue from those repeat customers that could be used to support communities that don't have the resources that they need. So it's it's not just a, you can't come at it from the perspective of, well, how would I buy one meal? But who's buying meals over and over and over again? And where are they coming from? What is your sense? You said my sense is that's not what's keeping from people coming to the downtown mall. What is what is your instinct saying that? Uh, I think it's I think it's some of a lot of things, but I think it's not just economics. I think it's cultural as well. I mean, I think that there's a both a a, a now and a, and a legacy of feeling like that's a, a place of you know for relatively well off white folks. Um, and so I, I don't Interesting. I don't think that that's something that we can we can change. Um, real easily with dollars Again, the anthropology here. Talk to me about, uh, then what do you do differently? What needs to be done differently? Yeah. What, that's branding and marketing. Yeah. What needs to be done that's differently? That's great. You know, that's, that's your area. I think it's great. I mean, I think it starts with, with holding, um, you know, events that are led by those communities. Um, I think it's often very hard to, like, you know, bring bring people artificially from one spot to another. I think you got to let them lead, you know, organically from their own places. The other side is like, you know, why don't, why don't more folks who frequent the downtown mall go to events and celebrations um, elsewhere in town? You know, I off, there's a lot of other things that we can do. I mean, there's, I, I, like you said, the, the downtown mall is a great spot, but there's a lot of other great spots in town. My fear is if we head down this road, and again, I wrote a thorough I'm curious of your thoughts. I'm, you know, you're a busy lady. Um, a thorough analysis on both raising taxes on ilovesevil.com and a thorough analysis on how public transportation and the lack thereof is negatively impacting our most impoverished citizens. Um, please check those out. My feeling is if we head down this road, Sally, and I'm going to cut to the chase because that's the kind of guy I am. Go for it. We will... Charlottesville, I, we have a satellite office in New Providence, New Jersey where we service our clients up there. I go up there once a week for 90 days, to study P&Ls, balance sheets, do the marketing buys, media buys, et cetera, et cetera. New Providence, New Jersey is a white island. And why it's a white island is it's because it's a bedroom community of Manhattan, okay? You go to New Providence and you look around and you see no, uh, you see no balance in the racial dynamic of the community. Where I'm going with this is, I fear that could happen in Charlottesville if we head down this path. I mean, I think there were a lot of fears about that in Richmond, too, before they raised their, their restaurant tax, and they've been seeing more new restaurants open. So, I mean, like we were talking about earlier, you know, in economics, there's always multiple forces pushing in opposite directions. I think on balance, they've seen that the meals tax has been good for them, or at least that it, it, the consequences haven't panned out like they feared. I mean, it feels like Richmond right now is a community that's undergoing a real urban resurgence. Um, it is. You know, a lot of times, and I, you know, I'm, I'm totally hearing you, and I think that those arguments are really really um, the compelling, but there are other forces pushing, pushing in the opposite direction, and sometimes those doomsday stories don't pan out. I mean, we, we thought that the minimum wage hike in Seattle was going to kill their restaurant industry, too, and, and that hasn't panned out in practice either. And when I say we, I mean there were people who thought. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm, as an economist, I'm always going to go to the data, and I think what we're seeing time and again is that um, that's not how it shakes out in the numbers. I love it. I love it. Corbin Snow, thank you for joining us on the program. CEO of Snow Knows. Corbin, we're doing some magical work on your website right now, baby. You're going to love what we're doing for you. Um, Josh Elwood, thank you for watching in Crozet. Mark Waldman, thank you for watching in Almaro County. Like and share the stream no matter where you're at. We're an hour in. I have so much left for you. Can we go an extra 10 minutes? Oh, we can do as long as you want. Okay. You're resonating. Yours. You're connecting with these folks here. Um, Public transportation, open-ended question. Talk to me about public transportation in Albemarle County and City of Charlottesville and Central Virginia and how it could be impacting uh, our community, how it could be impacting folks that are making less than AMI. Um, the public transportation system, and I'm not trying to knock anybody, I'm just putting the discussion out there. CAT, Charlottesville Albemarle Transit, 
I'm going to catch some, sh some heat for this, okay? Um, I already have caught heat for this, but I don't care. Um, CAT leaves a lot to be desired. The bus system is unreliable. Um, the, the infrastructure that CAT provides is, uh, un is not robust at all. It's very, um, it just needs to improve. Let's start open end first. Public transportation in this community. Your thoughts? So my understanding, and especially from the the interviews that we've seen on that great series lately, is that it's affordable. It's just not accessible in terms of frequency, and that's just a matter of how how much resources are we willing to contribute to it. I mean, we've we've got the buses in place, but we have to be willing to have them go more frequently and and have more drivers, and that's so that's like the best kind of problem to face. In that it we know how to solve it. It just takes more money. Yeah, and I think the. Okay, I'm going to get, get into specifics here. Josh, thank you for, we'll get to these questions. Jason Krigler, we'll get to you shortly here, sir. Thank you for watching, Jason Krigler. Um, someone, a family, not even a family, a couple, not even a couple, an individual, they can spend $1,250 a month, $1,300 a month for a ramshackle two-bedroom in the city of Charlottesville. Or they can go to, say, Louisa, Orange, Nelson, Fluvanna, whatever it may be, green, and get a nice two-bedroom and spend $750 a month, leaving an extra $500 a month in their pockets. An extra $500 a month, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out, that's $6,000 a year. An extra $6,000 a year when you're making below AMI is a tremendous amount of money. $6,000, no, no, regardless, is a tremendous amount of money. Okay, I'm not marginalizing $6,000. $6,000 is a lot of money. If they go to the outer counties for the $750 two-bedroom that's nice, they then lose that margin in wear and tear of the vehicle and fuel costs to get to the epicenter of employment, which is the city of Charlottesville. Could be 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes one way, and then 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes the other way back. Even worse, my most precious commodity, I would think yours is as well, is our time. And if I'm spending 45 minutes in a car doing nothing, that's keeping folks from filling out resumes, doing job interviews, folks from climbing the professional ladder to go from being below AMI to above AMI. If the public transportation system was more robust and it went to Louisa, Orange, Fluvanna, Nelson, Green, and it was more accessible and it was more reliable, these individuals could not rely on their vehicles to get to and from the epicenter of employment, Charlottesville, and could take the transportation to get to their jobs. I see public transportation as priority number one to fixing the affordable housing crisis we're in. Talk to me about um, your thoughts on this. Guys, I will get to your Twitter questions, I promise. You know, I think it's a lot of great stuff. I mean, it, and it is a regional challenge, and that means it needs a regional solution. I mean, we have no so I think many, I have that solution. Yeah, I think, I, mean, I think so many folks we know, especially coming into the big employers, whether they're, you know, working for the hospital system or, um, you know, they're, they're going home to those places, and so we have to be in this together. And that means that when we have these really stark locality boundaries, um, it gets in the way. Missy Good, thank you for watching the program. Um, we appreciate it. Like and share the feed. That would mean the world to me. We put a lot of effort into the show. All we ask is you like and share the feed. As a teacher, I appreciate how on message you are. The, I, I, the instructions are very clear. I try to be clear. I try to be clear. Um, and the reason, you know, here, I think the, I'm a huge proponent of letting the market come up with solutions as opposed to relying on bureaucracy and elected officials coming up with the solutions. Um, I think uh, the market will do what it does best and it'll come up with ideas. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, okay? It fits what I do. So where I'm going with this is whether it's a private-public partnership, we're seeing a successful private-public partnership, guys, with uh, Corn Capshaw, Riverbend Development, and Crescent Halls. Um, Dave Matthews donated $5 million to affordable housing. We need more private-public partnerships. What I'd also like is uh, an entity like the University of Virginia, who we've already talked about how it's dealing with a negative uh, PR and image situation tied to what it pays some of its subcontractors, what it pays some of its team members. Maybe the University of Virginia is the one that has to roll out a more robust public transportation system across Central Virginia, because Sally, the University of Virginia is the largest employer in the area. No one has more skin in the game than UVA. Talk to me about solutions to public transportation, what we can do that are outside of the box, because I don't want to rely on and I'm not knocking them, but I don't want to rely on five folks on Charlottesville City Council or City Hall to figure this out because I've seen how long it takes. 
What are your thoughts on UVA maybe jumping in the mix, maybe a public-private uh, partnership figuring this out? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously UVA is going to have to be at the table no matter what, because like you said, they're one of the biggest employers, and so it's it's a lot of their workers who are exactly we're trying to serve with these lines. Um, you know, what it takes for UVA to step up and, and play that role. I think um, we've got a president at the top of the university right now who's very ambitious about what we're going to get done to serve the community well. Um, I know I'm very eager to see what comes out of the, the commission that he's appointed about the kind of partnerships you're discussing, how we can be a good community member. Um, and I think you're right. I think that if if ultimately equity is at the top of the list, and I think that that's what it is, things like affordable transportation have to go hand in hand with the other challenges we face. We get questions coming in from Twitter. Give us some ideas of how you're going to beat David Toscano, an entrenched uh, incumbent. Well, you know, I have been super heartened by the positive response here. You know, it's not just you. It's not just the folks hanging out on social media everywhere I go. Um, people are ready for something new. Um, and, you know, once you have a chance to sit down and talk with them about what that means, um, they're very excited. I think people get that we're in a moment here, that the ground is kind of shifting under our feet politically, especially younger people. I mean, we just look at at the politics that we inherited and think, yeah, that's got to get better. Steve Jones Crozet says, Sally said earlier in your show, Jerry, that uh, she's not um, a professor for life. Um, does that mean she's a politician? Um, and the second question of the, the second part is, do you have ambitions of climb, climbing higher than uh, this, this specific district? That's a fair question. Yeah, the answer is no. <laughs> um, I am not someone who ever expected myself to, to find my way into politics. Um, you know, I was someone who thought, I thought I was going to be really happy. I love teaching. I thought that that was going to be a job that I would like for a long time. Um, I think like a lot of people, I felt really post-2016 in the last couple years, like I could be doing more. You felt inspired. Um, uh, yeah, Me too. So did I. Um, I think a lot of folks did. And I felt inspired, you know, specifically here in Virginia by a lot of the courageous candidates who stood up to say that we can do better than an old brand of politics. Um, I was, you know, particularly heartened by a lot of the folks who flipped seats in the House of Delegates in the last race who did so um, not by shrinking from our values, but by raising the bar and, and energizing a hunk of the electorate that had been sitting home because nobody was talking about things that mattered. Um, and so, you know, specifically, what are we going to do to win this election? I think it's important that everyone remember that it's a primary, and that means it's a really low turnout affair. Yeah, I mean, the June we, 11th primary determines the outcome of this election. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we live in a single-party city. That means that the Democratic primary is the gateway to representation for all of Charlottesville. So we need folks not to sleep on it. You know, they can't wait till November to get their 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 choice because a lot of the die will already be cast by then. So yeah, folks need to know that they can vote on June 11th um, and that they've got a real choice. You know, we think maybe kind of, you know, based on, on the latest voter turnout patterns, that maybe 10,000 people will vote in this election. Um, and that means that the winner has to rally 5,000 people to stand up on the same day and say 10,000 people 10,000 you know it? it might be nine might be 11 you know your guess is as good as mine but yeah high watermark for turnout in this district well, because is it's not a presidential grade. election yeah. so turnout is low 10,000 people put that in perspective guys there's three city council spots that are up for grabs in Charlottesville the June 11th primary will also determine the three city council spots in Charlottesville, um, 8,000 people, a little less than 8,000 people determine Heather Hill and Mayor Walker getting a spot on council. City of Charlottesville is 50,000 strong. 8,000 people are determining it. doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that is not a lot of people that is determining council. 10,000 people? Yeah. So, I mean, really the question is, like, if you're fired up about this race, how many friends do you have? Like, can you personally, you know, excite 10 people to come with you or, or 25 or 50? This is really just about who's going to hustle harder and show up. Well, and, you know, let's talk about strategy here in a second. Patty Bowden, thank you for uh, joining us. Charlottesville's uh, number one pet store. I'm, I'm seeing you, Patty Bowden. I hope you're feeling better, lady. Um, Catherine Lochner, thank you for joining us. John Craig Sebo Hop on Tours, thank you for liking and sharing the feed. If you can like and share the feed, that would mean the world to us. Harris, I know we have another show coming up, so I'm not going to put a lot more pressure on you. Um, but I do need to pick her brain about strategy. Look, I'm an advertising and branding guy. I, I cut to the chase. The top social media following in Central Virginia, bar none. Um, the only person that's doing a daily talk show like this in the area. I think how you're going to win this game, and, and I, Ian's watching now, finance director over here, how you're going to win this game is you're going to win this game on social and on digital. How you're going to win this game is putting this approachability, this charisma, this moxie in front of as many people as possible. You have an uphill battle, and that is an understatement, but I need 
I'm just giving advice, pro bono advice here. I think if you win the game on social and you know your opponent who is in his 60s does not understand the social dynamic that you do. And going and doing these live events at Three Notch, and she has a live event coming up that I encourage everybody to go to, um, sallyforvirginia.com, and click the events tab, and you can see her calendar. The next one is a meet and greet. Um, is it Tuesday, February 26th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. at Three Notch Brewing Company? Meet her, you're gonna be impressed. I think you gotta win this game on digital and social. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is a, uh, you know, where we gotta fight on a lot of fronts um, because different hunks of the electorate respond to different things. I think there's a lot of people that we can reach on digital and social. Um, and I think that we're seeing that more and more with candidates these days that people value actually getting to know who their representatives are, and that will come through on social media. Like, if you're not using your real voice on Twitter, it shows. Um, so I, you know, I think it's that true. that's, it's, it's, you can tell when someone's forcing it, right? Or when you're actually hearing somebody's off the cuff thoughts. Like I, I love Twitter cause I get to sit down with my coffee in the morning and like read a bunch of great stuff from smart people and then say, you know, here's, here's 30 seconds of what's going through my brain. Um, and I think people get that, like they know when they're actually talking to you. Um, you know, and I think it, there's, you know, we're going to do the, the traditional things too. We're going to knock every door in town and twice on Sundays. And if you, if you have to, to get that done, to get it done, we will. I would love to see some live feeds from Sally Hudson. I would love to see a daily feed. <laughs> oh, like uh, the Insta story at the door? Uh, Facebook Live, Ian's holding it. You get a tripod and you set it up in the office upstairs and you just be like, guys, I'm going to take three minutes of your time. I'm going to talk about this and I encourage you to like and share the feed. Yeah. Because you know what? We're doing it and we just had, we're not even, what are we, halfway through Q1 and we've had the best Q1 in 12 years. Um, and I don't know. Just piece of advice because I think what you have that uh, your opponent doesn't, and I'm not knocking your opponent and I'm not picking sides. I'm just spitballing and talking out loud. The concept of this program, guys, is two people in a barbershop and a bar just having a good conversation, and that's what's going on. I think what you have that your opponent doesn't is a uh, fresh perspective, uh, likability, um, approachability. Um, you have localized, humanized, and personalized your brand. You're real. And I think your opponent sometimes comes across as stodgy. Okay, stodgy. And I think that's safe to say. Um, I just would love to see you doing more of that. Because I think if you did more of that, people were like, damn, this candidate is for real. Ball's in your court. Thank you. Uh, you know, how do, how do we get you saying that on every billboard in town? Um, I, you know, I really appreciate Social the media. opportunity to, to come here and talk. And I, I'm, I'm all about having a chance to meet as many people where they're at as possible. Um, I think that, like you said, we've been very fortunate. There's a lot of small businesses in town that have been excited to play host. Um, we just want to get as, in front of many voters as possible. And if, it's, if it means that you got to rally 10,000 people, you can talk to a lot of them in person between now and June 11th. And I'm going to try to do as much of that as I can. Um, uh, last question, and then I'll close for uh, an opportunity for you to create a sizzle reel where you're engaging with that camera. We're going to send all the sizzle reels to you so you can leverage any way you want. Um, last question from Catherine Lochner. Catherine, thank you for engaging with this program. I'm grateful. Uh, have you sat in on the General Assembly when it's in session? And if so, what have you learned? What is good? What is bad? Absolutely. I've done a lot of that, mostly through my work with Fair Vote Virginia and, you know, not just the full body, but those subcommittee meetings where most of the bills go to die. Um, and I think that in that process, I, I learned that Richmond is a deeply broken place. Um, and I learned that there's um, an awful lot of folks who aren't willing to stand up and speak out for things that matter. Um, I didn't I didn't get into this without going to Richmond and seeing firsthand what I thought needed fixing. And, you know, sitting across the, the table from a lot of our current representatives, I felt like I had something to offer. Um, so, yeah, I think that I think the next set of people that we send to Richmond in 2019, I mean, every single seat in our state legislature is, is up for election, all 100 delegates, all 40 senators. Um, you know, they're all up and, and who we send in the next round will determine who writes the new rules for how Richmond works with all of that, that new blood in the mix. So I think that it's important that we have people who remember that they are public servants first, um, not politicians, um, and that what they're interested in doing is making sure that Richmond is responsive to the people back home. Give her, uh, that's a sizzle reel. I'm creating some overtime for you. I'm willing to do it. Um, 
sizzle reel that and call it uh, General Assembly. Um, Hate Free Schools Coalition, thank you to Sally Hudson for taking, uh, for talking about the continuing work of Hate Free in uh, Albemarle County Public Schools. Um, watch the I Love Seville show. She took a strong stance on getting the hate imagery out of our public school system and protecting our children of color. Politicians take note. We are paying attention to who is silent and who is not about these issues. Sally Hudson showed us today that she is not silent and that goes a lot. Um, in our coalition. That's from the Hate Free Schools Coalition. I just got that from uh, via Twitter. Um, I'm getting uh, a lot of folks saying, Sally Hudson, go to the school events and meet the parents. They need to see this in person. Um, you are doing a tremendous job on this program. We didn't know who you were, now we do. Um, Harris, I'm gonna give you a little time to prepare. We're gonna close the show with what did you learn from the, the interview today. Before we do, let's give Sally an opportunity to connect with everybody. We'll do it with that camera right there. And it's an easy question for you. You're gonna have this answer. Why should people vote for Sally Hudson in the June 11th primary? You know, I think you heard it just right then with the folks from the Hate Free Schools Coalition. Um, I think a lot of times politicians are silent on things that matter. Um, and they'll go their, their record and they'll defend their record. They'll say, hey, I voted for this or I voted for that or I patroned this bill. Um, I think that a public servant is so much more than the sum of their votes. I think they have a voice. I think they have a platform for shaping people's sense of what's possible. And right now is a time for, for leaders like that. And I think that all throughout my life, I, I've shown that I'm someone who's, who's not afraid to stand up for an idea before it's cool. Um, I think that that's the, the kind of folks that we need to be sending from Richmond, for people who are being responsive to what's right and wrong back in their communities and are willing to take that voice into those halls of power where we so often stay silent on so much. That was so baller. That was so baller. So, so baller. Give me some dab. Dab it up. That's what I'm talking about. Um, I appreciate your time. She gave us uh, no commercial breaks. Put her asked her some really hard, tough questions. Um, 77 minutes, and the 77 minutes felt like 17. Is that all? I feel like, yeah. Oh my gosh. Even at this? You crushed it. It's 147. Wait, what? You crushed it. You crushed it. <laughs> you cr it's 147 right now. Um, so impressed. I'm grateful for your time. Um, I wish you the best of luck. I am not taking a side. I don't want people to think that. I'm just getting the platform out there. And, and I feel like if people have more knowledge and more education about what's happening in our community, they can make more informed decisions. That's the entire concept of what we're doing here at I Love Seville. We are trying to put education and knowledge and we're trying to put um, the people that are dictating the pace and tempo and future of our communities in the spotlight so you can like them, dislike them, you can learn from them, Maybe you ignore them. Whatever it may be, it's your prerogative. But that's what makes our country great, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank Sally Hudson for joining us. I'm going to go to Harris Tolber now. Harris Tolber, we're going to put you on the spot. Western Almaro's <laughs> finest, James Madison University's finest. Harris Tolber, my friend, what did you learn today? Jared, I learned a lot today, and I have a couple points. Um, first, I want to say that you know the first three adjectives that come to mind from Sally today is that she is relatable, she's charismatic, and she's also humble. I think the first thing she said about um, her opponent, the incumbent, is like the, the incredible amount of respect she has. And I think that's a testament to her character. I would also like to comment on um, one issue that we were talking about today, which was um, the Albemarle County School issue over the Confederate flag. And I went to Western Albemarle High School, and I was there five years ago, so very recently. And I think that probably a lot of kind of older community members might be wondering if it's a relevant, like, like are, are students actually walking around displaying that imagery in school? I can tell you firsthand experience, yes. Like, I mean, it was only five years ago and every now and then I'd be walking through the halls and I'd be, you know, dumbfounded by certain imagery. So it's a relevant issue, and I just wanted to comment on that just from personal high school experience here in the county. Um, apart from that, I really enjoyed the interview today, and um, it was a pleasure to have you on the, on the show. Thanks. My boy, Harris Tolver, my boy right there. I'm gonna give you a flying chest bump once this program is over, okay? I, hey, this is, best, the job. That is the best that you've done. You, that was you being real, authentic, and genuine. I'm so proud of you, homie.
Thanks, I'm Jerry. so proud of you, homie. <laughs> uh, my name is Jerry Miller, guys. The, uh, the Caring for Creatures show is going to start at 3 p.m. You guys know animals mean so much to me. There is a no-kill animal sanctuary in Fluvanna County called Caring for Creatures, led by a walking saint named Mary Burkholz. And for 30 years of her life, she's bypassed, bypassed love, She's bypassed building uh, uh, an entrepreneurial business to literally give her sweat equity, her time, and her energy to saving the most at-risk dogs up and down the East Coast, the dogs and animals that are on the kill list that will be euthanized. She takes them away from these shelters, and she brings them to her home. She rehabilitates them, and she rehomes them. She is... I'm getting choked up about this. She is amazing, amazing. And you're gonna see her at three o'clock today. Um, I wanna thank Sally Hudson for being a part of this program. June 11th primary, ladies and gentlemen, June 11th primary, I'm gonna say it again, June 11th primary. My name is Jerry Miller, this is the I Love Seville Show. We close the same way every time. Please give more than you take. If you give more than you take, you will win in the long run and our community will be better. Lastly, please embody the golden rule. That's how we live our lives. Open the door for somebody. Smile to somebody. Say yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Be good to people. Anybody can make something better, okay? Try. Don't say you can't do something because it's not going to have an impact. It will have an impact. My name is Jerry Miller. It's the I Love Seville Show. We will connect with you in an hour and nine minutes with the Caring for Creatures Show. Love you guys. Thank you so much. That was a blast. My um, so this is what you can expect from us. Anytime we did sizzle reel, he's going to chop them down. They're just shorter or approachable videos. It's like highlights from the interview. Cool. Um, we'll send you a Google Drive link. Uh, I need to make sure I get your email address. And Ian's email address will add you to 